closely with Pakistan that this will work and everybody will be happy. She does not realize that between Pakistan and India, there is a tremendous amount of competition. There is no amount of, uh, you know, I, I read an article where they say... There's no amount of Midwestern if, talk and a pretty face yeah. on, in a sari that's going to change that. <laughs> you know, I saw an article in the paper where they said, if, she, if India gave Kashmir to Pakistan, do you think all these fights and everything else will stop? No. You know, because there is such a thing called envy. <laughs> You know, America is in trouble today is because there's so many countries that are envious of them. And they don't realize that when it comes to that particular geographical area, yes, there are people who are envious of India. How is India doing what it is able to do? Well, maybe. I think there's, it's, it's much more complex than that. I think that the border issues go back hundreds of years, not just the short history between the two nations becoming um, two distinct nations. We have always had border disputes. It's $1,800 to attend this particular conference. Let's face it, the keynote speaker gets paid. In this case, her fee is $100,000. So she's going, and she's, of course, going to talk about America rising. I'll tell you this, she will be a hit in India because India is fascinated with Sarah Palin. And I know this because I was there during the election cycle when she was, uh, all the news was about Sarah Palin. She was on the front page of every major newspaper. People wanted to see her. They wanted to see her in a sari. They had cartoons of her. Uh, there were, you know, shows and, and all kinds of people who wanted to, they were fascinated with her. So I think if she goes, she's going to have a, a lot of popularity with the Indian public. Yes. And one of the cartoons was, why is she going to India? Well, she could see Russia from her backyard, but for India, she has to take a plane so, so far away. It's not in her neighborhood. <laughs> you know. But I really think it is interesting that she's going there, and I hope she learns. It's not as simple as three countries sitting down together and say, terrorism, our common enemy, let's just put our hands together <laughs> and say, together we shall overcome. You know? I bet she'll look great in the sari. <laughs> Ramesh, who do you think of? When we talk about multinational companies, what's, what are the names that come to your mind? Oh, Pepsi-Cola will be number one, Coca-Cola, McDonald's. IBM, yeah. right? Yes. All of these big companies. Well, the Economist did a great article on the new kind of global company that is on the rise. These would be diversified multinationals from emerging markets. And guess who a large part of this article was about? Tata. Tata. Tata has made all kinds of progress within the last 20 years. In fact, it has ridden the rise uh, of India over the last 20 to 30 years. And Tata is the most remarkable of these because it is active in everything from cars to chemicals to hostels to steel. I mean, they are in every major market. And in some ways, a lot of Indian companies are like this. Reliance, for example, dabbles in many, many markets. Um, TCS, um, which is an offshoot of Tata, is Tata Consulting. They're everywhere across uh, very many major markets. But that was the point of The Economist's article, is that these companies are actually better at doing the kinds of things that U.S. companies used to be good at doing because this is the world they live and breathe. They are in these fast, changing environments that are very dynamic, high growth rates, young people, fresh ideas, and they're used to working in emerging markets, which means they're sometimes working in places that don't have great infrastructure, don't have great uh, internet or broadband, but they somehow set themselves up and they succeed. But they came from an emerging country, but right now in Britain, they are the largest corporation. They own the largest steel mill, they own the largest tea company called Tetley, a steel company is called Chorus, and they, of course, own the biggest automobile, which is... Banana and the Jaguar. Jaguar, you know. <laughs> right. And so it's a company that has really come up, and somebody made a comment last week saying, if I was to invest in one company that I believe that has no corruption, and straight as an arrow, it will be Tata. This is really an amazing thing because within these companies are business teams that are very nimble decision makers and have proved strikingly successful at seizing opportunities in other emerging markets. In other words, their instincts have been homegrown because they have been, uh, they've basically grown up in these emerging environments. 
they are much better at making decisions, whereas U.S. companies are often tough to get things moving and going. There's a lot of lobbying going on. These companies have the benefit of just going through, setting up shop, and doing well. Yeah. You know, we used to interview these folks. Ratan Tata, I interviewed. Rahul Bajaj of Bajaj Atto, I interviewed. I remember when CII used to bring all these big honchos, they would make sure that we also get an opportunity to talk to them. Of course, now CII thinks, hey, we can only talk to Wall Street Journal. We can only talk to the New York Times. So they don't bring them over here anymore. <laughs> CII, of course, you know, they're just like uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I mean, they're a pretty big organization. Actually, the, the article does mention that, that the biggest thing holding these companies back is the fact that Still, internationally, they're viewed as being nationalistic companies. So Tata is still seen as an Indian company. And what they're trying to do is say, no, we're a global company. We had our origins out of India. So they are actively trying to escape some of that. It's a fantastic company. Of course, my next story is...